All right, Crazy Marisa family, welcome back to a brand new video. Now, I know that a lot of you guys are in the process of getting your admission offer letters or you simply want to know how much money you can actually make in the US. Now, I'm not talking about how much money you can make after you get a job and after you graduate, but how much money can you make as an international student studying in college in the US? Some of you that may not be interested in the details, you can skip to this timestamp in the video for the numbers. So we're going to kind of break everything down for undergraduate, masters and PhD students. So I cover the entire like international student realm. But now, as you can see, the different types of jobs that you can possibly have as a student include having co-ops, you have internships, uh, both of your assistantships, so your research and your teaching assistantships and on-campus jobs, which are by far like one of the most popular things that I've seen students do. Remember the joke where companies ask fresh graduates that they should have two to three years of experience before even starting out on their first job? This is exactly how you get that experience. Now, co-ops and internships are a great way to add that skill set and relevant experience in your resume. And they're one of the highest paying jobs out there as well. So the main difference between the co-op and the internship in general is co-ops are usually part of your academic curriculum and they're a little longer. So typically they may be like six months or, or 12 months and they are mostly in an industrial setting depending on what degree you're doing. So if you're doing mechanical engineering, you may be placed in like an automobile um, industry, biomedical engineers, maybe in the healthcare industry and so on. In many cases, you can actually earn credits through co-ops, which means that they can also go towards fulfilling your degree requirements. So that's a great way to add some more experience to your degree overall. Now, internships, on the other hand, are a little bit different, whereas they are slightly smaller. So they tend to be somewhere between one to six months. They're usually done over break. So like a summer break or a winter break. And they're typically not a part of the academic curriculum. As a student, you could be required to find an internship on your own. It's not something that, you know, your department or your college will just like have you enroll as part of the academic curriculum. And in some cases, they can be unpaid as well. On the other side of the spectrum, we have assistantships. Now, these are divided into two types, research assistantships and teaching assistantships. The research assistantships are open to both undergrad and graduate students. So literally any student on campus, as long as you're studying in that college, can apply for these. And I've never really like spoken about like what these are. So let's break it down into the difference and what these actually include. So as a research assistant, you will be performing experiments and working under a professor for a respective lab. Now, if you are an undergraduate student, you can be expected to do things like running experimental protocols, maybe taking some documentations, collecting data, analyzing it under the guidance of, you know, some senior students or the professor themselves. Now, if you are a student that is a graduate, which is a master's student or a PhD student, you may have your own research that you are, you know, moving forward and overall contributing to the lab. Almost all universities in the US have professors that have their own labs and these these labs recruit undergrad students, graduate students, PhD students on a semester wise basis. Now this is not a new concept that is introduced. This has been going on for years. So when you come in as an international student, you are allowed to obtain these research assistantships. It's not something that is only available for US citizen. The only criteria is these research assistantships in most cases can only be obtained for the college that you are studying in. On the other hand, let's look at what the teaching assistantship is all about. Now these positions are generally taken up by graduate students, so masters and PhDs and in this TA position you don't do a lot of research your goal and job is to actually assist a professor in taking a class so it can be a course based class like physics 101 or it can be a lab um, like a bio lab 101 um, course that you're assisting the professor with now when you when I say assisting this typically involves things like proctoring exams um, conducting office hours clearing the doubts that students may have uh, correcting some of their assignments, helping the professor uh, grade some of their papers and so on and so forth. Now, you'll notice that in both of these positions, whether it's the RA or the TA, it does require a significant amount of time. So it is upon you as a student to find a good like academic balance in such a way that you're able to do your job effectively and also study your own academic curriculum. Moving on to on-campus jobs. Now, as you guys can see, there are so many of them. 
uh, all the way from campus ambassadors to working in dining halls to working in sports recreation to cultural activities. Basically, as long as it's on your campus, your college campus, you can take up the job. And a lot of you might think that these are, you know, pretty crappy jobs and they are kind of demeaning even in some cases. I know that kind of goes on in some students' heads, but you guys have to understand that they're really good paying jobs. And as a student, you learn a lot of interpersonal skills by doing these jobs. So there is nothing wrong in trying to get some experience. I personally um, worked in the dining hall. I worked in the community center. I even worked under the sports of the referee. So I've done like three of these and I got to learn a lot like people skills, learning to interact and you know, deal with conflict. You just learn so much. So don't disregard these simply. All right, so we are in the end game now. Now, before you guys get overwhelmed with this table that I have over here, this one is specifically for the undergraduate students, as you guys can see. The next slide will be talking about the graduate students. So on the left here, we have the methods of making money. We have our on-campus employment that we just looked at in the other slide. We have your co-op positions that we looked at in the beginning and internships that we looked at in the beginning as well. And as you move towards the right, we have other details for these descriptions. So what these type of like jobs include, what are the requirements that you need to have, especially for international students, for example, things like your co-op and internships, you may need to have some special approval by the DSO. Uh, you may need to get your CPT approved. So definitely look into that because as soon as a job technically goes off campus, you will need some sort of work authorization. So keep that in mind as an F1 international student, right? You have maximum hours for each of these jobs. In some cases, if you're working on campus, you'll mostly have a cap of 20 hours per week. Whereas other cases, you'll have 40 hours per week in the case of co-ops and your average pay before taxes. Now, clearly we can see that co-ops are one of the highest paying jobs, which I mentioned earlier, but the other jobs don't, you know, they aren't too bad either, especially considering that the on-campus jobs, you can work for the on-campus job for much longer. And what I mean by that is, let's say you can do a co-op for what, like six months, but on campus, you can actually work the entire academic year. So you have more time to, you know, do that work. Now you'll notice that a lot of these pays are a big range. For example, the on-campus employment is $1,000 to $1,300 a month. Co-ops earn $3,000 to $6,000 a month and interns can earn up to $2,000 a month. And this huge range is because the average pay can actually depend on the location where your college is or where you get your co-op. For example, a student who works in California or New York may earn higher than someone who has a college in the Midwest, uh, Central America, right? And the second thing is department. It's not kind of like just uh, unknown that you have certain departments like software engineers or computer science engineers that do earn higher than bio-based degrees, for example. So there is a, a kind of like a pay disparity there. So with those factors in mind, we have those ranges that are listed down here. Moving on to our graduate students, which are masters and PhDs. We have the same table over here. So we have our method of making money, which the two primary methods are your research uh, assistantships and your teaching assistantships. Now, uh, master students can also get co-ops and internships. Again, you'll have to find out through your DSO what your special requirements are in terms of obtaining uh, a CPT or an OPT if you're, you know, after graduating, getting this position. Um, but for the sake of this particular table, let's look at how much you can earn with these two positions. So for the research internships, we have our average pay of uh, $1,000 to $1,500 a month. And with our teaching assistantships, we have our average pay of $800 to $1,700 a month. And these numbers are before taxes. Now, there is a big emphasis on that because when you get your paycheck, it's not going to be these exact numbers. They'll probably be slightly lower considering that there is some amount of tax that is deducted. This is very normal um, as a person that you're in the US, you will be subject to a tax deduction, whether you are an undergrad student, master's, PhD, and irrespective of what type of job you do, on-campus employment, co-ops, internships, RATA, doesn't matter. Now, as a student in the US, even if you're on your F1 visa, you have to file your taxes every year. This is a very important step that you have to do if you're earning money. And the right way to do this is through Sprint Tax. You cannot simply go on any online platform and file your taxes. 
for F1 students, Printex is the way to go. And this is probably what every college international office will recommend as well. On average, in the US, uh, tax deductions range between 15 to 28 percent, depending on which state you are located in. So that's the deduction you'll see on your paycheck. As a student in the US, if you've lived here for less than five years, you are considered a non-resident for tax purposes. So Sprintex is a non-resident partner for TurboTax, and it's the only online solution which offers tax e-filing for non-residents. As a student, you can't spend endless hours trying to figure out these tax documents and trying to get them in the right order because it's very important that all of your documents get filed on time and they get filed correctly with the right numbers. You guys already have a lot on your plate studying, doing your exams, assignments, and on top of that, if you're doing part-time jobs. So to make your life a little bit easier, you can use the Sprintex e-filing system and you can use the link in the description below to get a $5 off for your filing. Now you guys thought that I was done, but I do have one more source of kind of passive income. So I don't want to leave you guys hanging. And these are some like passive income sources somewhat high risk and not like a traditional way of making um, regular income as a student but nevertheless they do exist now the first one is stocks now as an f1 student you can invest in stock the app that i personally use is Robinhood. it's a very like user-friendly app and personally i used it as a student and i still use it uh, but the big thing is do your research invest in stocks that are kind of like safe like voo or the s p 500 and you know, um, as a student, don't don't put all of your money in the stocks. Like, don't be financially irresponsible. Um, I will leave a link to my Robinhood code in the description below. If you guys want to sign up, you can get a free stock when you do. You will need uh, to sign up when you're here, so you can do it when you're still in your home country outside the U.S. The second one is crypto, and this kind of falls under the stocks umbrella as well. And it's available on Robinhood too. So we have our Bitcoin, Dogecoin. These are the two popular ones that you guys may have heard of. But do your research and if you want, you can also get um, in the game there as well. Uh, the next one is your credit card cashback. Now, this might be one of my favorite ones in this list just because opening a new credit card, there are so many like benefits and cashback opportunities that you can have, not just as a student, just in general. So it's good to start using those. Uh, obviously, it's it's unsaid that if the credit card is giving you like a limit of two thousand dollars that doesn't mean you spend all of it and you come under the loan but it's good to take advantage of their of their benefits now for example the discover credit card gives you like a cash back match on the first year so you can earn anywhere between 500 to a thousand dollars um you have airlines credit cards where you get thousands of miles so you can you know save those up maybe when you want to fly back home to your home country you have hotel credit cards so depending on you know whatever you want to use you can also sign up for these credit cards as well and the last one is a non-traditional way of uh, earning money which is renting out your room now i know that as international students a lot of you guys may go home once a year maybe to visit your family your friends um, so while you're out for maybe that summer, you can rent out your space, your room, maybe your living room. If your friend has gone, like offer this to them and that will help you cut down on your own rent. And it can also be like an additional, you know, a uh, couple hundred dollars a month for that summer. So that's not bad at all either. So time for question of the day. But guess what? We have no question of the day in today's video because in the last video, I ended up replying to all of the comments. So everyone's question has been answered. And if you haven't checked already, feel free to go check. Um, I checked and there are replies to everyone down there. So there was nothing for me to pick up an answer. Uh, but nevertheless, leave your question down in this video so I can pick one to answer in the next one. Uh, but thank you very much for watching. Like this video if you're watching till this point. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Back in there.